Hi, my name is Dr. Simon Agar, chiropractor and clinical nutritionist, and we're talking about disc injuries. Very, very common. We see them every day in the office, and we're talking about uh, what are discs, what do they do in the spine, how do we manage them, and what is appropriate for understanding and managing a disc condition, and what is a disc condition? What does it look like clinically, and what does it look like for you, the patient, wondering if you've got an injured disc? So. Uh, you can see here, we've got the, a, a low back version of the spine here, facing that way, where we've got a vertebrae disc, vertebrae disc, vertebrae disc, spinal cord going down the middle, and all the nerves coming out, joints in the back, and the bony bits that you can feel on the back of your spine, like that, right through here, okay? We also have discs throughout the spine and into the neck too, and so we're going to be talking about discs, not just about in the low back, but also as regards the neck, and you can see a little icon with a neck with some pretty bad forward head carriage there. So the nature of the disc is a cartilaginous unit. Uh, if we were to take one of these out, it would look like this, where we have a, a, uh, a nucleus in the, in the middle, which is always pressurized, and it's pushing all different 360 degrees all the way around to keep this hydrated. And this is layers of ligaments in the annulus. This is called the annular fiber. So we've got the nucleus, we've got the annulus, and then we've got all these ligaments in there. And the ligaments are very dense because we've been straining these guys for years. And what happens when we bend forward, this pushes back. When we bend back, it pushes forward. We bend to the left, it pushes to the opposite direction. And when we push to the right, it pushes the opposite direction through here. Distributes weight and it helps with all of our flexibility in the spine, makes us flexible. Um, as young children, we have uh, potentially we have more cartilage in the body than we do bone as that forms and that's why we're more flexible as kids. As that slowly ossifies and, uh, and, and solidifies and matures over the years, by the time we get to the age of 35, um, all of our cartilage, as, 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 as extra cartilage is ossified and we're a mature skeleton at the age of 35. Uh, and that is the sternum finally ossifying at the age of 35. But coming back to the disc, uh, that's the nature of the disc. It's this cartilaginous uh, collagen structure, uh, a lot of ligaments in there, and it's tough. It's very resilient, and it occupies the spaces between the vertebrae. And this gives us some dynamic movement. It gives us some dynamic flexibility. Some of the problems that we get into is due to its relationship with the rest of the disc. You can see here, uh, in these posterior foramen, that's the fancy word for holes, where the nerves come out on the right side of the lumbar spine, as you can see them right through here. Uh, if the disc bulges, or if the disc gets bigger or smaller, it's going to affect this. If the disc, disc bulges back, which is commonly called a herniation, uh, that means that some of this tissue has got stressed and weakened. A lot of times it gets torn if we've done some bending and twisting and twisting, bending and twisting and lifting, you can appreciate that when we bend this way, we've got a lot of pressure on this side of the disc. And if we do it repetitively enough, if we're tired enough, if we're uncoordinated enough, uh, then we can get um, a strain in this area. When you strain this area of the disc, one of the things that happens is this tissue through here gets broken down, gets a little weaker, and because this, the central of the disc is still pushing a lot of pressure, from the nucleus, then this will push this way a little bit and this will bulge. And that is called a herniation. If it's less than 25% of the disc, and you can divide the disc up into quadrants, kind of like that, if it's 25% bulge here, it's called a focal herniation. If it comes across the whole back area, like this, it's a bulge, okay? Bulge is more than 25%. So we've got a herniation, which is any bulge in the disc, which is less than 25% of the disc. And we've got a bulge, which is a more broad-based, which you see um, very commonly also. We see these clinically every day in the, in, the, in the clinic. Now, what gets so exciting as far as symptoms is that when the disc goes back like that, you can see that it's going to get a little closer to this nerve. And if this comes back, if it bulges back this way, I don't have a blue pen to, to, to mark this, unfortunately, but you can see if the disc bulges back, it's going to be closer to this nerve right through here. And when you get a disc closer to a nerve like that, the nerve doesn't like it. And the nerve is going to give you some 
kind of a pain. And it may be pain, it may be discomfort, it may be numbness. It could be numbness because these bottom nerves, these bottom three nerves, form the sciatic nerve, which comes down the sciatic notch of your pelvis. And you can see it coming right through these guys, and it comes right out the notch in the back of the pelvis. It's, that is the size of your sciatic nerve. It goes all the way down the leg. That would be the left sciatic nerve. And if it gets irritated, whether it's irritated by the disc, which is very common, or it's irritated by the joint, the spinal joint is just behind it, and the joint can be irritated too, and both can be irritated. You can get pain in the leg, in the buttock, across the back, sometimes wrapping around the front, because these nerves will control everything in the top of the leg too. Sometimes wrapping around into the groin, because the nerves that come out of the back control everything in the groin too. And you can have all of it going on, and you can have just bits of it where you get no pain here, and you just get tingling and numbness in the toe. Or you get a failure to lift the toe all the way up, or a failure to hold it up against resistance. You start getting some weakness, because these nerves control all of your function, your motor function too. So any changes in motor function, that's strength. Any changes in uh, sensation, that's numbness and tingling, hot and cold. Uh, any changes uh, in pain and the pain could be like a dull ache. It's often, because most people herniate discs in the posterior, because we're mostly bending forward and lifting most of the time, one of the things that happens uh, is that you'll get a posterior disc herniation or a posterior disc bulge. And that will be worse when you sit, because when you sit, you bend forward, which pushes all the disc material towards the back, and this will bulge, because this disc, when you bend forward, will push this way. You'll get increased pain across the low back. You can get pain going into the buttock sometime. That's why when you've got a disc injury, you want to be up and walking as soon as possible. And the more walking you can do, the better after you get to a certain point in time. Uh, so sitting is going to make it worse. So why does sitting make it worse? It's because you've got some disc involvement. What if you didn't do any lifting and bending? Well, maybe you've got some deterioration. You know, one of the ways that this happens is degeneration. Uh, it happens very commonly in the neck, also happens in the, in the low back. So let's have a quick look at degeneration and see what that looks like. And how can that possibly affect the low back? So if we have this disc down through here, and you can see this bottom disc, if this degenerates so that it loses height, because discs will lose height over time if they don't receive adequate nutrition. So what's adequate nutrition? Before we look at a degenerating disc, it's blood supply. And cartilage only has blood supply for the outer third of the disc. There's the blood supply to the outer third of the disc. Now the inner two thirds, I can see what you're thinking, you're going, how do we get nutrients in and how do we get waste products out? We've got to have mo motion, we've got to have movement in there. So what happens a lot of times, people get very stiff because this joint gets jammed a lot. And what do I talk about when I talk about a jammed joint? I'm talking about losing some of the wiggle in your joint, okay? And that happens very commonly down through here. And if you've got a joint which is not moving with that accessory joint plane, which is a prerequisite for normal motion, then you've got a lot of stress on this disc. And if you have a sudden movement, because this can't move, and it's, it's acting all in one big glob in, rather than several individual joints, then you're gonna get a lot more stress through the discs. So res chronically restricted joints or sore joints in the back is gonna make you more prone to not only having uh, uh, discs that are more susceptible to injury, but it's going to mean that you're not getting as many nutrients into the disc because they rely on the forces of motion to feed this inner two thirds of the disc. Okay, you okay with that? Good. So one of the things we're going to look at is as this disc gets smaller, which can happen if it doesn't get enough nutrients, if it gets excessive wear and tear, or if there's a large generalized inflammation in the body like uh, problems with blood sugar, uh, chronic infections, et cetera, et cetera, all the things that you can read about in my inflammation video, uh, then this is going to not do as well. And as this recedes like this, if this is half the size, then this is going to go this way. And you're going to lose some height, and guess which joint is going to take more stress? This joint is going to remodel to get bigger, because it's going to have to take more stress. And look what happens. We get bigger bones in the back of the joint, and look what happens there. We get bone spurs. And we get remodeling to handle the extra weight because the disc is, is getting retarded. So uh, you can see how we can get extra stress on the nerve, not just from a disc 
that can lose some integrity with a disc herniation or a disc bulge or some degeneration over time, but we can also see how that affects when it, we lose disc height, it affects the remodeling nature of the back to cope and you can get some bone spurs which can also encroach on the nerve, giving you some kind of sciatic problems too. Uh, we see the same thing in the neck where we have discs in the neck region and we looked at this earlier, there's the discs in the neck, they're not as fat as the discs in the low back, but the joints aren't as big either. One of the big things that happen if the spine is facing me, we have a lot of forward head carriage where we get a lot of pressure through this area. That's what this little motif shows here. This chap's smiling up here, but, but when you've got a spine that's coming forward like that, gravity acts this way, and we get a lot of degeneration in this lower neck. And we see this very commonly in men and women, a lot more in women, especially middle-aged women, where they'll start noticing extra pain in their hands and fingers, and, and they're sedentary. And it's because of this, the, the posture's affecting this. So, Posture is a big determinant of neck degeneration. Uh, whiplash injuries, which we see every day uh, from uh, mostly car accidents and sporting events, where the head gets whipped very quickly, uh, it injures the joints and ligaments because it happens so fast, the brain doesn't even get a chance to splint and protect the neck, they just get injured. Uh, so we see a lot of disc injuries in the neck too. And the same thing, we get a herniated disc, it pushes up against the nerve, you get pain, sometimes you get uh, weakness, sometimes you get pain down the arms if you've got a cervical disc. So, now you understand a little bit about what discs uh, do, their structure, their performance, their relationship to the rest of the spinal segments, how they occur, uh, how do you manage them, what, what works better. We alluded to earlier with a low back disc, uh, after it's getting uh, after it starts getting better, usually with decompression, if it's a, if it's a herniation or a broad-based herniation, a broad-based bulge, um, we can usually manage it conservatively. If it's, a, if it's a herniation which is extruded and you've got bits of disc that are separated and they're, they're up and down sitting in the, in the spinal cord, that's tougher and that's more of a neurosurgical consideration. So that's why we work with neurosurgeons with a lot of disc cases. Um, but many times, people who have extrusions, they go right to the surgeon because they have massive loss of function, they have massive motor loss. The ones that we commonly manage are ones like this where we've got a focal herniation and we're able to decompress it. So what does decompression mean? It gets on one end of the, of, the, of the vertebrae and separating it from the other end. We're decompressing these discs and the same thing in the neck we're decompressing this area and the aim of decompression is to take the stress of this area so we can deliver therapy into here to take the pain down and we can start doing extension exercises in the low back lateral bending exercises in the neck or extension exercises in the neck so that this starts bulging the other way and this starts coming down over time so a combination of the manual therapy and the exercises as well as sometimes we'll treat concurrently with pain medications through their medical doctor and natural anti-inflammatories too that can make a big difference that's kind of the non-surgical path to health the surgical path to health is somebody going in when it's a really big herniation we can't get on top of it uh it, it's too much going on maybe there's some extrusion they will go in they'll open you up and they'll scrape out this stuff they have like pliers you'll be put under, they open you up and they'll just get the pliers and they'll pull it away. It's kind of like crab meat. And, and then you're in a situation where you have a scar. They've pulled away all the stuff with pliers and then we have to re get sent back to us for rehab and we're doing the same stuff that we were doing. And hopefully the scar tissue remodels so we don't have excess um, uh, scar tissue in and around the nerve. Whether the nerve's here, there or up in the neck okay and um, the, the best way to work with these is to try and prevent them in the first place so you don't have to go to that surgical option so how do you maintain a disc joint health we need to keep the joints moving so whatever you're doing with your stretching and strengthening if you've got a joint that doesn't doesn't move well get it adjusted uh, so we can restore some more normal joint motion um, that commonly that can be foot stress playing into a more stressful low back, so make sure you get your lower extremity 
check to make sure I do a gait analysis on you, um, do a weight bearing stress on your arches, uh, see if you have any excessive pronation or any of those 26 foot bones is restricted. Um, that can make a difference up through here. Weight can make a difference sometimes. Uh, and general inflammation, general lifestyle can make a difference. So you have the overall amount of inflammation in your body. Stretching and strengthening is very important. We talked about cobra stretches for the low back. Uh, the uh, McKenzie technique uh, pioneered by uh, New Zealand uh, physical therapist about 30 years ago works very well. Strengthening exercises. The more you can uh, strengthen your core, you can look at the lower cross syndrome uh, video that we shot for, for how that all interacts, how the muscle imbalance can interact with this area, uh, it'll help you. And of course we do stretching and strengthening as part of our treatment with any disc um, injury. Finally, nutrition, what you put in the body is going to be a measure of how inflamed you are, right? If you've got a good diet, uh, uh, you're going to be less inflamed. If you've got a rubbish diet, and you, you don't have regular meal times and your blood sugar is all over the place and your cortisol levels all over the place, you're gonna be more inflamed. You're gonna be more susceptible to degeneration. Um, so there's a bunch, a whole bunch of anti-inflammatory nutrition. You can look at some of our other posts or some of our blogs on that, a natural alternative to non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Uh, that makes a difference. And there is a place for anti-inflammatories if the inflammation is too great and we need to use that concurrently with um, disc management when it's acute. So I hope that's given you some idea of the nature and extent of some of the disc injuries that are common, uh, how we see them, why when you have a low back uh, disc inflammation it's going to be worse when you sit, when it's going to be better when you start walking, when it's going to feel better after you've gone through a course of uh, adjustments, uh, why when you, if you've got a neck disc that's deteriorating or herniated you'll get uh, extra stiffness every time you look down like that and it's going to start relieving you when you start looking up or going to the side and also traction both in the low back and in the neck can be very helpful in these cases. Again, my name is Dr. Simon Agger, chiropractor and clinical nutritionist and thanks for listening.